for you um, that you may not have thought about previously. So when it comes to key skills, it's essential to understand not just where you fit into the landscape, but also how it's evolving. Especially in the tech industry, it's booming and there's so many innovations uh, with AI, artificial intelligence, machine learning, cloud computing. Um, companies from startups to tech giants are all in a competitive hunt for top talent. Um, and that, that may, I'm sorry, that not only have the right skills, but can also innovate and adapt quickly to the rapidly changing technologies and environments. And I'm sure you've seen this, especially the past few years, there's been so many advancements and so many changes. Um, in the market and so being making sure that you're being adaptable and you can kind of stay on top of what's happening out there so in addition to your technical skills uh, companies are really looking for candidates who can demonstrate problem solving uh, abilities being creative and forward thinking um, and have the potential to learn new platform and strategies pretty quickly each role has its own unique requirements and typically demands a blend of coding expertise system design and sometimes knowledge of specific frameworks or platforms so as you prepare to enter the work field, align your learnings and projects with these market trends, showcasing your ability to not just tackle these challenges, but also contribute to real, prob real world problems um, that are going on. And so some of the key skills that I highlighted, there's a lot that you would put on your resume in general, but these are the ones that tend to stick out as what the companies are mostly looking for right now in the job landscape. So problem solving skills, which I mentioned, being able to um, quickly solve problems and think of, uh, of a different way to look at something and and also collaborate with teammates to make sure that everybody is giving great ideas and come up with it with a solution that's going to work for everyone. Being adaptable again, everything is changing so quickly, um, especially with AI and I'm sure you all um, see it every day, but almost everything we use nowadays has an AI assistant to it. Even LinkedIn has it at, uh, right now. So there's you know, being adaptable and open to all these changes is something they're really looking for um, in a skill set. Creativity and forward thinking. So thinking ahead of the game, you know, what can happen down the road, especially if you're staying uh, staying in tune with what's happening in your field uh, and knowing what's happening down the road, you can get some great ideas and strategies and be creative in your field um, to add suggestions. And then again, quick learning. So uh, it's super important to be fast on your feet and be able to learn things quickly. There's, um, they're not expecting candidates to have everything that they need, but they do want somebody that can be adaptable and can quickly pick up these new systems and processes. So overview of the current job market. So the current job landscape, especially in technology, um, specifically is competitive with rapid advancements and a continuous demand for skilled professionals. Emerging technologies are only creating new job opportunities, but also transforming existing roles. So people that are already in roles are having to change the whole way that they do their job and, and new processes and systems. Um, it's requiring professionals to adapt and continuously update their skill sets. In addition, the shift towards more remote work has also expanded job opportunities geographically, allowing professionals to work for leading companies without relocation. So you've probably seen this since COVID as a lot of things went more remote and they're open to more remote workers versus being in office. Um, this is positive on one, one end of the spectrum. You could look at it as a positive thing, which it is because they're able to give more opportunities to people that may not work in that city or that market. However, on the flip side, this convenience also means that there's greater competition when it comes to these roles and applying for jobs. So emphasizing the need for candidates to really distinguish themselves through solid technical skills, problem solving capabilities, and a proactive approach to personal and professional development. So when you think about and in, in having worked on the HR side, you know, you would post a role and you could get, let's say before COVID, maybe 50 to um, 100 roles or 100, sorry, applications come in and you're trying to go through all these resumes. Well, once COVID happened and people are open to more remote roles, we could have thousands of, of um, applications come in. And most companies in the HR department, they don't have the bandwidth or the headcount to really go through all of these resumes. Um, and we'll get to um, some other things down the road that will help you in this aspect. But just think about that when it terms when, the, when these roles are posted on these websites like Indeed, LinkedIn, and so forth, there's so many more applications coming in than what normally would have, have happened several years ago. So that kind of brings me to the resume and cover letter section. So if you understand or have heard of applicant tracking systems, I would love for you just to put like a thumbs up in the chat or say yes, so I can kind of understand who is familiar with this and who is not. 
them. Perfect, perfect. Everybody's heard of it. Okay, great. <laughs> so applicant tracking system, um, or we call it ATS, is a computer software that human resource departments are using to process the overwhelming number of applications they receive for these job openings. So for job um, seekers, the most important thing to understand about the system is that it enables employers to really filter your resume based on specific keywords. So the most suitable resumes are then forwarded to the hiring manager for manual review. And so what I said earlier is in, in my specific example, when I was in a human resource role, there was two of us in the department. So on top of doing you know, talent acquisition, training, hiring, and all of those things, we are also doing with employee relations and payroll and benefits and everything else that kind of falls under the human resource umbrella. So that is why these companies are using this as a helpful tool for them to kind of sift through these resumes because they just don't have the time to look through them. So it's super important that you have the right keywords kind of positioned naturally throughout your resume um, and that you tailor each of uh, your resume with these relevant keywords that are clear. Um, it needs to be ATS friendly format and doing so will help your application pass through that initial screening and increase your chances that a hiring manager will then read your resume. Um, and so your resume is extremely important in two aspects, getting through the ATS system and then also making sure that the meat and bones of your resume is where it needs to be for um, so it's attractive to the hiring manager and also aligns with the role that you're applying for. Then I want to switch over to LinkedIn. So um, how important is LinkedIn? And I don't know, I'm sure all of you are on it. Um, and we'll talk about being active on it a little bit later in the presentation. But did you know that recruiters and hiring managers will spend three times the amount of time on your LinkedIn profile than your actual resume? And so I wanna go through some things to consider when it comes to your LinkedIn. So the structure of your LinkedIn profile should be more of a storytelling. So in the sense that um, it's a social media platform versus your resume is a very professional based document. Not that it has to be too casual, but it can be more in a storytelling format, especially with your about section, um, when you're talking about your past work history and your roles. I never recommend my clients to just copy paste their bullet points onto the, pro, the LinkedIn profile. The reason is we want to give more of a description and kind of tell a story about the history of your job, right? Or what you did in that role. So usually two to two, three or four sentences is great to kind of summarize what you did, what you accomplished while you were in that role. Um, it's kind of what, what LinkedIn is more, um, uh, I would say, more attractive to your hiring managers because they can look at your resume and read the bullet points and go through all that. You want to make it a little bit different, but kind of really showcase who you are as a candidate. SEO keywords. So just like your keywords for your ATS um, systems on your resume, you want to make sure your LinkedIn profile also has these SEO keywords positioned throughout. Um, and that helps when the recruiter or the hiring manager is on the back side of LinkedIn on the recruiter's version. They can they do keyword searches in the same sense um, and they want to be able to pull these profiles up based on those keywords. Skill descriptions under your title. So I highly recommend that you at the top of your profile um, underneath your where you have your name to also put some keyword skills. You know, I like for me, I, I don't remember exactly what I have on at the moment, but um, leadership trainer or um, professional resume writer, things like that at the top, because that also helps assist in your HR. A lot of people, when LinkedIn first kind of rolled out, um, would put the current company that they were working at, which is fine, but you're going to have that down in your job history as well. So it's better to put some keyword descriptions of who you are as a candidate and what you bring to the table underneath your title. Um, professional profile photos. So this is a touchy subject, but I always um, have to bring this up, especially with my clients when it comes to your profile picture on LinkedIn. Number one, actually have a photo. <laughs> Don't have the little silhouette that they give you automatically. It's really important to have a photo. Um, not necessarily uh, crucial to have it on your resume, although that is an option if that's something that you would like to do. It's more of a, a European thing that kind of came over to the United States about five, six years ago. I've seen a little bit of an increase in it, but it's not, it's not a necessity because they are gonna go to your LinkedIn. So um, 
making sure you have a professional photo is really important. Um, there was a an article that came out through LinkedIn about a year ago, and it said that hiring managers and recruiters are more likely to click on your profile as a candidate if your profile picture is warm and inviting. And specifically, if you're smiling, showing your teeth, they're going to want to click on your on your picture before another candidate that either doesn't have a photo or they don't look warm and inviting. Maybe they're not even smiling in the picture. And I've seen this a lot, especially in this new, um, I would say the new generation, uh, is they're having these, these profile pictures where it's maybe more artsy um, and they're not smiling, their mouths closed or looking away and there's distracting things in the background. But you really want to think about always putting your best foot forward. And if this is the first thing that they're going to see when they come to your profile, you want to make sure that it's, it's a professional looking profile. And there's lots of options. I'm not saying you have to go out and get professional headshots done, although if you really want to, that's a great option. Um, there's a great website called headshots.com that you can upload a photo to them, pick a background, and they will actually doctor it up to make it look like a professional headshot. The results are really, really great. Um, I believe it's about $50, so it's worth your investment. Um, and then if any of you are savvy on Canva, you can make your own on Canva. Um, and so that's another way to consider it's a little more cost effective, but really think about your profile picture and, and always, again, think about that's your first representation of you to a hiring manager. And so they always talk about your first impression is the most important. That's part of it. So re really consider that when you're looking at your profile picture. Um, also, your background banner. So LinkedIn has some standard background banners that you can choose from, which is fine. Um, but I do recommend you try to do some kind of um, customized banner if you can. Again, Canva is a great resource for that. You can They have templates for LinkedIn background banners. So you can just type that in and um, create your own banner. Um, anything related to your field is really great. You want to showcase yourself as a candidate and kind of what you're passionate about. Um, so again, just like your profile picture, think about your banner and how that is going to be represented to the recruiter or the hiring manager who's looking at your photo. Um, another really important thing about your LinkedIn is optimizing your URL. If you go on your profile, and I probably should have pulled up LinkedIn, kind of showed you live, but uh, on the, on the right-hand side, there is a way to, to actually edit your URL. And LinkedIn will naturally give you, you know, the LinkedIn URL with your name and maybe some numbers afterwards, but you can actually change that and do like mine is retail coach and trainer um, or whatever is related to your field that you can do and kind of that helps again, optimize your URL with SEO and so forth. So think about that as well. And then your skill sets. So just as your skill sets are listed on your resume, it's important to make sure that you're listing them throughout your LinkedIn profile. Now you can actually list skills under each um, specific role that you've been in, or just in general, you can list them out. And they and LinkedIn will let you list up to about, I think about 50 skills on your profile. So I would definitely max that out um, as much as you can. Okay, who, uh, before I go on, actually I wanted to ask a question in the chat. Give me a thumbs up if you have a personalized banner in the background of your LinkedIn or a thumbs down if you don't. Got a mixed reviews here. Okay. Awesome. So really think about that. And if you guys are familiar again with Canva, it's the easiest thing to use. You, and you can always use the LinkedIn standard ones that they offer, but I, I recommend doing a more personalized one if you can. Great. All right, so now I want to get in some, into some effective job search strategies. So we're going to talk about different online platforms that you can use when you're doing your job search, the importance of networking, online learning, and customizing your resume. So first, online platforms. I'm sure you're well aware of most of the online platforms when you're doing your job searches. Um, so I just want to go through a few of them. But Indeed is by far the most popular. It has the most job listings that are posted on there. And actually a lot of HR um, platforms that companies are using, when they post a role on their website, it usually filters straight to Indeed. So that should be your number one stop um, is to make sure that you're checking that first to see what opportunities are there. Next is LinkedIn. The great thing about LinkedIn is you can connect directly with the hiring managers or recruiters, um, which I highly recommend if you apply for a role. And I'll talk about that um, later on in the presentation. But LinkedIn's so great because it gives you the ability availability to connect with people in your industry or for the company that you're applying for. 
do a little outreach message to them as well with that, that other platforms don't have that um, ability to do. Glassdoor. Glassdoor is great for job opportunities. Uh, plus, they give you salaries and reviews. So it's a great way to kind of see what other employees or past employees have said about the company. Now, take it with a grain of salt because sometimes you have employees that maybe did not leave on the best terms and they're going to put a bad review up. But it's good to kind of get an overview of what the culture is at a company because although you're interviewing for a role at a company they're kind of interviewing you as well right you need to make sure that this is going to align with what's important to you um and and what what's going to be the right fit both on both sides so that's a great tool and resource to kind of look through some companies monster.com is another great one it's very customizable and easy to use so um, it can help you really filter exactly what you're looking for and then if you're looking for more of the remote job, um, Flex Jobs is a great website that you can go on and look for some specifically remote opportunities. It's a newer, it's a newer website, but um, there's there's a lot of great opportunities on there that you can kind of search for if you're really wanting to do something remotely. And then startups. So there are so many startups that are happening out there in the in the marketplace. Um, Wellfound is a great resource if you want to work for more of a startup company. The positive side of startups is that you know, if you come in at the ground, you can work up pretty quickly in terms of experience and titles in a startup. Um, so if that's something that interests you, uh, you might want to check out Wellfound as a, as a resource for that. And I'm sure there's many other platforms that you guys might know of that I didn't mention, um, but definitely these are ones you need to check out and, and make sure that you're active on those. So I want to get into networking. It's one of my passions. And um, the reason is, is that Opportunities throughout life, throughout your career, can really come through having a strong network. And networking continues to be one of the world's primary sources of employment, believe it or not. And when you think about networking, I, and I, I'm going to highlight LinkedIn because that's an easy way to, to really build your network, but I'm also going to go through some other networking opportunities that you might want to consider. Um, but according to LinkedIn, although 79% of professionals agree that networking is valuable to their career progression, only 48% consistently keep in touch with their network. And then furthermore, about 38% of professionals say it's hard to stay in touch with their network. And I think the solution to this is to make sure that you're strategically following up with these with these connections. And LinkedIn is gives you the ability to kind of connect with a, a vast variety and a large amount of people, which is awesome. But always be strategic too on who you're connecting with because when you think of LinkedIn, although it's a social platform, it's really a tool to help you in your career growth, right? So think about people that you wanna connect with that can give value to you in your career growth or you can give value to them and be strategic about your connections as well as you know sending a note when you make a connection to them hey it's great to connect um, let me know if i can support you anyway or i'm really excited to learn from you people you'll be surprised people are very responsive on linkedin so definitely use that as a resource um, but the key again following up is going to be the biggest asset to your networking abilities so LinkedIn has 774 million users, which is crazy. But when you look at the statistics, only 2% of those users are actually posting on the network. So there's so much opportunity to utilize LinkedIn to your advantage. And I coach this a lot with my clients of being very active on LinkedIn. And what I mean by this um, is that it's one thing to go on there and, you know, connect with a bunch of people or um, just kind of look through your newsfeed, which I think we all tend to do very naturally. But think about how you can add value on the platform. Are there articles you can post? Are there quotes you can post? Or if somebody in your network posted something and you really, um, you know, found value in that or really um, appreciated that post or what they had to say, go ahead and repost it and maybe add some comments. Um, and don't, you know, don't neglect of making comments on other people's posts. And I hate to sound like a social media manager of, you know, the algorithm and all of that, but it's not really about the algorithm. It's about showing your, um, your passion, uh, showing your interest in different areas and different fields, and that you're contributing to the, to the overall um, aspect of that and adding value to others. And so, I highly recommend you try to post. I mean, I'm not going to tell you to post, you know, once a day or whatever, whatever feels natural and comfortable to you. Um, and I'll get into another reason later on in the presentation about why that's important. But 
I highly recommend you start kind of carving out a couple minutes, um, you know, every week to do a little post or make a couple comments on other people's posts, as well as connect with as many people as you can. I think you can do, um, I believe, and I could be, don't quote me because I could be wrong, but I think it's about 100 connections a week you can do. So I would try to max those out if you can. Um, and again, with people in your profession or that would be um, a positive influence in your network. So some other really great ways to network is local networking groups. And I know this can be a little uncomfortable sometimes for people. Actually, give me a thumbs up if you've been to a local networking group. Anybody? Good, good, awesome. Um, so local networking groups are really great and it may not be, it doesn't have to be specific to your job or your field, but it gives you an opportunity to meet people in person, right? And that's something we lack these days. Everything just like this call is behind a screen and we live behind these screens and there's something to be said about a human to human connection. And so if you can have the opportunity to go to some of these in-person networking groups and really have conversations with people it can add a lot of value and you just i always tell people this you never know who somebody knows right so you never know when an opportunity could become available let's say you meet someone at a networking event and you share ideas talk about what your feel of what your profession is and then that person goes and meets somebody else who's looking for somebody in your field they're going to think of you first they're going to say oh my gosh you got to call john um, and you got he's gonna be great for your company. And that's how the networking piece can really help you find employment and career growth. Um, Eventbrite is a, a website that shows a ton of different networking opportunities in your area. You can filter by your um, where you live, your city. And um, so I highly recommend to go on there and start looking and seeing if you can attend at least one a month. Um, but when you go to these networking events, what I want you to do is kind of change your mindset in the sense of how people can help you and start thinking about how you can help others, right? Adding value to others because it's, a, it's an exchange of energy. And if you go in there thinking, how am I going to help other people? And you start having conversations and um, giving some great advice and offering to introduce people to other people in your network, that's how you kind of create this uneven exchange of energy. And then that other person is going to feel that and they're gonna try harder to help, to help you and support you. And so then you have this great referral partner or networker um, that you can call on and, and have conversations and help each other out in your career growth. But again, the key is to constantly follow up, put it on your calendar, put it in your phone. Maybe you, know, you meet someone at a networking event and let's say six weeks or um, eight weeks down the road, you put it in your calendar to follow up and just send an email. Hey, just thinking about you. How's everything going? I really enjoyed our conversation. And that's how you keep those lines of communication open. Um, and that's going to help you really excel in your career because again, it's all about who's in your network. And when you meet someone face to face and have that human connection, it means so much more than just connecting on LinkedIn. Um, so another great way to look for some um, networking groups, there are tons of online network networking groups, and you could just basically Google those and just see what's out there, see if there's anything. A lot of them are um, there. I will say some of them want to charge a fee to join. Hopefully it's it's not too expensive. Um, there are some free ones out there, but um, I found a platform called Alignable. And that I really want you to um, take a look at. It's similar to LinkedIn in the sense that it's a it's a place to network and connect with people. However, Alignable actually has these networking calls, like probably five to six every day, and they're different. Different types of um, calls could be like you know small business, or it could be just a general networking call, or just they call them quick connects. But it's a way where you can hop on, hop off, and have quick like one-on-one -on -one chats with a bunch of people. So if you're ever feeling like, okay, I'm feeling frustrated in my job search and I'm not sure what to do. I've applied for all these roles. I'm not hearing anything. Get yourself out there and start networking. Hop on Alignable, create yourself a profile. It's free. And then just hop on a couple of these networking calls and see who you can get to know and who you can meet and kind of grow your network that way. So if you haven't checked out Alignable, definitely get on there and take a, take a peek. And then the last is just basic uh, organic networking. And that's, you know, current or past acquaintances, if you have an alumni association um, that you're a part of, or anybody that went to your, you know, previous school that you want to connect with. Um, and another thing I always tell my clients is, take a piece of paper, 
go through your phone, your contacts, your email contacts, your phone numbers, make a list of people that you've either worked with, that are acquaintances, or that you've had a conversation with or networked with, just make a list of people. Then start reaching out, send them an email, send them a text, however you feel comfortable, you know, based on how well you know that person and just let them know, hey, I'm looking for a new role. I would so appreciate, you know, if you have any suggestions or recommendations um, and just put yourself out there a little bit because you never know. People love helping others. And so that can actually open up and some opportunities that may not um, have come to fruition before. And just a quick statistic that a lot of companies have roles that they don't actually post because they try to fill them internally first before they go out and post them externally. And so if you know somebody that works for a company and they're like, hey, they were just looking for somebody who does just what you do, let me refer you. Your referral, having an internal referral is like gold when it comes to job searches. Because right now, most companies, and or sorry, I should say a lot of companies, are really um, honing in on referrals. So if an internal employee will refer a candidate, they're more likely to want to hire that candidate than going externally. So really think about that. Who, how can you leverage your network for your next role? Okay, online learning. So in the world that we live in now, we're so fortunate to have all these great opportunities and platforms to do quick learning um, on, on subject matters or courses or things you know, of that nature that we never had before, right? So as I spoke about earlier with the way that the job market is constantly adapting and changing and, and really making sure that you're staying up to date with what's happening and new things like AI technology and so forth, there's a lot of great resources that can help you in that area. And as you're looking through job descriptions when you're applying for roles, you might see some platforms or systems that they really want you to understand or to know. Um, and you can quickly go and find a course on it or do a training or something so you can say you've got a little bit of knowledge around that, that platform. LinkedIn Learning. So if you have the premium version of LinkedIn, um, you can get LinkedIn Learning for free. It's included in there. If some LinkedIn Learning, I'm sorry, what I was gonna say is LinkedIn will give you a free 30 days, I believe, for the premium version. So it might be worth checking out and then just you know make sure you put it in your calendar when if you wanna cancel it. Um, but it's definitely worth it to jump on there. You can also do other things, uh, have more searches and connect with more people if you have the paid version. Um, but it's a great resource in general, or you can take these courses and just pay for them as you as you go. Uh, but it's a great platform to look for these type of quick learning and courses that can help you in terms of your career. Colleges and universities are doing a ton of online courses as well. Um, so those are a great resource to really check out if you're trying to beef up some of your um, some of your learning. And then some other great online platforms um, that I know of, and you may know of some more, um, but Coursera is a great one, Udemy and Skillshare. So write those down, check them out. Um, if that's something that interests you or you feel like could benefit you in terms of, of your um, profession of what you wanna do to have a little bit more knowledge in certain areas. So customizing your resume. You may not like what I'm about to say, but when it comes to applying for roles, one resume does not fit all. And so it's really important that you are thinking about each job that you're applying for and looking at your resume to see if it's aligned, right? So just some things to consider, and I'll go through all of them, is um, have you thoroughly read through the job description of the role that you're applying for, right? Sometimes we see the title, we skim through it, and we're like, oh yeah, I can do that. But really read through and understand what specific skill sets they're looking for, what platforms they want you to have knowledge of, um, anything specific that they want in this in their candidate for this role. Because if you don't understand that, then you may not have the right resume to send to them or it may not be optimized in the right way for them to want to bring you in for an interview. Does the information on your resume align with that job description? Should you adjust your resume based on each role? My answer is yes, which you probably won't like me for, but <laughs> and is a cover letter relevant? So again, when you're applying for roles, re read through that job description and then read through your resume. Does your resume and what's on your bullet points align with what they're looking for? If they don't, then you might need to readjust your bullet points. And I'm not saying you have to rewrite your whole resume every single time, but you want to make sure that the skills that they're looking for are listed in your resume if you have them. 
don't ever falsify your resume. Um, and if there's specific things that maybe you have done, but you neglected to list it on your resume, you want to make sure you add that in there. Because when HR, when we write a job description, it's very specific for a reason, because these are the, the guidelines that we want to stay in when we're looking for a candidate. Okay. Um, and then is a cover letter relevant? So cover letters are really part of your overall presentation. So when we spoke about, um, you know, first impression and how important it is under the LinkedIn section, it's the same way. If you, when you're presenting a cover letter with your resume, it speaks that you you took the extra step, right? You're showing a professional presentation to them. Do they read the whole cover letter? Probably not. I'm going to be very honest. They might skim it a little bit, but it's part of your presentation. So. It's not a necessity, but it does help in the process of the fact that they're going to say you took that extra step to write a cover letter that and this also helps with how they're looking at you as a candidate because they're saying, you know, this person is really professional. They have a cover letter. They have, you know, their resume is on point for what we're looking for. It all kind of ties in together. So cover letter, again, it's it's up to you and they're not going to read the whole thing. Maybe some hiring managers will, but the majority of them are not. They're going to skim through it, they're going to skim through your resume, they're going to go to your LinkedIn, right? Um, but it's still part of your overall presentation of your best foot forward. So just something to consider when it comes to a cover letter. So interview preparation. There's a, there's a lot that goes into an interview preparation. And there's these are the things that I really um, am very passionate about because I don't think they're teaching these, the, these things in the school anymore. And so it's important for you to understand the process um, and how to speak to your background, how to present yourself um, in, in, in different types of interviews. Um, so we're going to go through all of these. But preparing for an interview can be daunting due to the variety of formats that you might encounter. So now with the virtual, a lot of companies are doing virtual interviews first before they bring you in in person. Be prepared to discuss your past experiences using the STAR method. Um, it just helps you structure your answers by focusing on the situation, the task, the action, and the result. So the situation being, you know, this is this is the situation for the specific area of your job that you did. These are the tasks. This is the action that you took, and these are the results of what you did. Why you took that action on that task, and your results showcase that. So we're going to go over types of interviews common interview questions. Um, I hope I don't bore you with that part, but it's a lot of information. So I want to make sure I give you some, some good ideas around those and how to structure your, um, your conversation. So there's three types of inter interviews that you're probably going to have, right? The first one is usually a screening interview, and that's where you would get a quick interview with HR and they're just going to screen you or, or um, someone in talent acquisition. They're going to screen you, which means it's usually like a 15 to 30 minute conversation. Um, they're really just going to ask you a few questions to kind of get an initial impression of you. Um, they're going to make sure that you do have some of the skill sets that you talk about and that that align with the job description. And it's just this, it, the, the reason that they do these screenings is because it's one thing to look at a resume and see a candidate's experience and skill sets, but it's another to have a conversation with them. So that initial conversation is really crucial because that's where it's going to, they're going to weed out if this is the right candidate or not. And they're going to take the candidates that they feel could be a good fit based on that screening. And then they're going to pass it on to the hiring manager. So those are really important. They might seem more casual, uh, might seem like it was a really short conversation. So just know that most of the time those are just a screening. So don't take if you have a really short interview, don't take that as a bad sign. Just know that they're just screening you to see if you're the right fit to move the, to the next step. So then we're going to talk about virtual interviews versus in-person interviews. So again, a lot of companies nowadays are starting with these virtual interviews. Um, and the reason is because it's easier for them to jump on a virtual interview, virtual interview than to bring someone in the office and set up interviews with a bunch of different people. And so it gives them the ability to kind of go through a lot of different candidates quickly. Some things to really consider, again, I always talk about presentation, but think about your background. So there's a lot of things like I have just a solid, I chose to do a solid wall today in the presentation versus a virtual background only because my Google Meet virtual backgrounds do not look right. They look very messy for me. <laughs> so, but I definitely recommend if you don't have a very clean, solid background to, to do one of those virtual backgrounds on Zoom or Google Meet if you can. Um, you don't want them to be distracted if there is a lot of stuff happening behind you. So think about how you can 
not have any distractions, have something very simple. Um, and so they can focus on you as a candidate, right? And we, we sometimes we don't think about that. And I've had interviews with people where there's a lot happening in the background, the dogs running around, you know, things like that. And, and that can be very distracting. And again, you're presenting yourself as a, as a candidate for their, for their company. So you wanna make sure that you're putting your best foot forward in that sense. I'll take a quick sip of water here. And then noise as well. Make sure you're not in a noisy place where that's going to be a distraction. Please, please, please don't go to a coffee shop to do an interview. Don't go to Starbucks. You would be surprised how loud it is in there and distracting. Even if you have a virtual background, there's always so many noises happening. So just try to find a quiet place. I mean, if you have a quiet coffee shop nearby that you know is going to be quiet, that's fine. But try to steer clear from that. Um, it's just too distracting on their end. And attire. So really important, again, how you present yourself. Think about, you know, they talk about dress for the job that you want. So think about that in your mindset when you're preparing what you're going to wear to this interview, even if it's virtual. Now, you can wear shorts on the bottom, but a nice blazer, you know, dress shirt, something on the top that they can see um, is really important when you're doing a virtual interview. So don't, don't neglect that aspect of it. And then in-person interviews. So just like that human to human connection, this is your most important interview, right? You're gonna you're gonna have a face to face conversation with someone, so presentation is is very important in that aspect. Um, always bring two copies of your resume with you on an in person interview. They might have already printed one, but it's just in case they forgot to print one or somebody else decides they want to jump in on the interview with them. It's always good to have an extra one just to hand out and shows you're prepared for that um, for that for that moment. So. And then this is going to be kind of silly, but I always like to tell people this because it can really help in a sense when you're going into an interview, you can be really nervous, right? You can have like the jitters and you're, you know, thinking about, especially an in-person interview, you're thinking about, oh, I don't, I'm so nervous. I don't want to say the wrong thing. There's a really great TED talk um, and I need to find <laughs> who it was that did it because it's been so long. I can't remember, but it talked about having confidence. And this is a really silly thing. and I'm going to do it for you because I have, you know, I'm not embarrassed anymore. But um, but definitely try to do this if you can before an interview, you know, go somewhere where you're in private or you're, you know, go to the bathroom and do it or whatever you want to do. But it just helps you kind of open up your body and feel a little more confident. So all you have to do is before you go into whether it's an interview or something that you're going to be nervous about doing is just put your arms straight up in the air, keep them up there for a few seconds and breathe. And then bring them down and then just kind of adjust yourself, roll your shoulders back and you're going to walk in there and you're going to feel more confident. And I know it sounds silly, but I promise you it works. It just gives you it gives you that sense when you when you put your arms up, you feel like a bigger person. And when you're going into a place where you're or a situation where you might feel nervous or intimidated, it just helps you feel like, OK, I'm more confident. I've got this, I'm supposed to be here, I can do these things. And it just helps and kind of bring the nervousness down a little bit. So I know it's silly, but I always like to share it because it definitely works and it could help you in that moment. And I hope you I hope you find value in this and, and you uh, try it out next time you're in that situation. Okay, so common interview questions. So this one's gonna be a little long. So if you need to get a quick drink of water, I'm gonna, I wanna go through all of these, but also give you some really great insights into what you can say for these questions. Um, so the first one that they, they're always gonna say is tell me about yourself or walk me through your resume. So just know this isn't a personal question. I'm not gonna say, well, you know, I've got two kids and you know, I live here and you know, all these different situations. You wanna you wanna really think about how to talk about your professional background versus your personal. And personal can come into play on certain aspects of it as long as it's kind of leading through your to your professional um, side of things. But when they ask this question, it's not a personal thing, unless they specifically say, you know, what do you do for fun or what do you do on your, your downtime? And that's fine. They're opening up that conversation. Uh, don't just read through your resume and tell them your job history. They can see that right in front of them and they're gonna, you're gonna lose their attention really, really quickly. So they wanna hear stories about candidates. So it's not a story about your personal life, but it's more about your professional. Uh, your profession about how you found the field what interests you about your field and why you're so passionate about it it's giving them a sense of who, who you are as a person and how it will really relate to your profession so again always think about 
the personal story that you can tell in a sense of, okay, I started, you know, I went to college and did this. And I really decided that I wanted to kind of switch gears and go into this direction. And because I was a part of a, I don't know, a club at school and I found a lot of interest in it. And then I kind of shifted gears and decided to do that. And then I got my first job and then realized that, you know, I, I really wanted to excel in this career and kind of talk about it in an overview um, versus just listing out your experience on your resume. The second question is, why do you want to work for this company? <laughs> so please, please, please do your research on a company before you go in for an interview. Um, sometimes uh, hiring managers or, or interviewers will actually test you to see if you have done your research. But mostly, they just want to know that you understand who they are as a company, their culture, um, what's important to them, what's important to you, and that you're going to align and you're going to fit well within the company. Uh, number three, what type of work environments do you prefer? So again, do your homework on the organization. Um, know its culture before you go into the interview. Your research is going to really save you in this, in this aspect. Your preferred environment should closely align to the company's workplace culture. And if it doesn't, it may not be the right fit for you. So also keep that in mind. Again, you know, you're interviewing for a role, but you're also kind of interviewing them to see if that's the right fit for what, what values you and what's going to be important to you in a work environment. So for example, you might find on a company's website that they have a flat organization structure or that they prioritize collaboration and autonomy. Those are key words that you can mention in your answer to this question. So as you're researching, think about those, those keyword pieces around their culture and what the environment is for them. Now, if the interviewer tells you something like, you know, the company that, um, that you didn't uncover in your research, maybe they're giving you some tidbits into the inside of the company. Like our culture appears to be more buttoned up from the outside, but in reality, it's a really laid back community with a little, little competition among employees. So try to describe an experience that you've had that maybe dovetails with that. Your goal is to share how your work ethic really matches um, that of the organization. So something to really do some research on before you go into a company. Uh, Glassdoor is a great resource for that, by the way. Number four is what can you bring to the company? So again, focus on skills, right? Look at the job description. What are the specific skill sets that they are looking for in a candidate for this role? Um, especially the ones that I had uh, listed previously, those four skills, so problem solving, being creative and forward thinking, adaptability, being a quick learner, really talk about those things and, and um, as the skill sets that you can bring to them and, and uh, add to the team environment. Number five, how do you deal with pressure or a stressful situation? So the reason that they ask this question a lot is that they really want to know, like, do you hold down the fort or do you crumble under pressure? They want to make sure that you won't have a meltdown when the pressure becomes a little bit too intense and deadlines are kind of hanging over your head. So the ability to stay calm under pressure is a highly prioritized talent. So make sure you share maybe some examples or some instances of where you were able to remain calm despite you know, something kind of going out of whack. Um, it's a, Or if not, let's say, you know, you can always say it's a skill that you're really developing and acknowledging that and including the steps that you're taking to respond better to being under pressure in the future. So for example, you could say, you know, um, that you've started like a mindfulness practice to help you better deal with stress. But really, they just want to make sure that you're going to be able to kind of stand your ground in these situations and be, again, forward thinking, problem solving, um, and be able to take on and handle those tasks as needed. Some of them might ask, do you prefer to work independently or on a team? And it's not necessarily a trick question, but they just want to understand how you work better as an employee. So your answer should be more informed by the research that you've done about the company culture and the job that you're applying for. Um, you should always expect that most work environments are definitely going to have some kind of team aspect. So I would steer away from saying, I only like to work alone, unless it's, well, even remote jobs, you're probably gonna have some collaboration amongst your teams, but um, many positions are gonna require you to work collaboratively with other people um, in a sense. So making sure that you're highlighting the best traits of your personality and how they kind of fit in with the job requirements. Um, it could also be your interest to answer this question by highlighting the advantages and disadvantages of both situations. But I would always kind of keep that in mind as far as the team environment. The majority of companies are looking for a team player that is open to collaboration. So have that as um, one of the, the terms that you're going to be using when you're answering this question. When you're balancing multiple projects, how do you keep yourself organized? 
So every employer is sort of understand kind of how you're utilizing and managing your time and making sure that you're actually staying productive and being efficient in your role. So they're also looking to understand if you have your own system um, for staying on track with your work beyond the company's schedules and workflow plans. So be sure to emphasize, emphasize that you adhere to deadlines and take them seriously and give examples, you know, whether you you know, block out time on your calendar or what works best for you of how you're able to manage a bunch of different projects and, and make sure that you're achieving those deadlines as needed. What did you do in the last year to improve your knowledge? So sometimes when we're in a role, we kind of get stuck in the mundane day to day and we don't think about continuous learning. Like I touched on earlier with like LinkedIn learning and all those other uh, platforms where you can learn courses, it's really important to continue to educate yourself and stay on top of what's happening in your in your profession. Um, so uh, they just want to make sure that you're using your time, you're uh, efficiently know that you're um, brushing up on your knowledge and, and using these different tools and resources to keep yourself ahead of the game. So be able to speak to that um, when it comes to um, what did you do to improve your knowledge? And then everybody's favorite question. <laughs> What are your salary expectations? All right, give me a thumbs up if you if that question doesn't bother you, but give me a thumbs down if you dread that question. <laughs> oh, good, okay, got it. Okay, so I'm gonna kind of walk you through on how to approach this answer, because it can be a tricky one. Great, I see we have a lot of confident people on here, that's awesome. So before you walk into an interview, you should actually already know what the salary is for this position you're applying for. There's lots of tools. Um, sometimes it's posted on LinkedIn. Um, sometimes on Glassdoor, you could at least see some kind of salary range or in, in the general job posting, they might actually have a range for you. Um, but check out, there's websites, uh, like, like I said, Glassdoor, there's one called Fishbowl um, or vault.com for salary information. Or just in general, I think salary.com will give you a generalized range for that specific title. Um, but again, it's really gonna depend on the market. So I think Glassdoor is probably a great resource for that because it's uh, specific in terms of um, the range based on all markets. It can, can kind of help you uh, be guided more in that sense. Um, you can also ask people in the field um, by reaching out to people in your community on LinkedIn. Uh, employers are always going to ask this question because every position is budgeted, right? So when when they come up with a role, whether it's an existing role or they're creating a new role, HR sits down with finance and they talk about, okay, what's their budget range for this role? And the reason they have a range is because obviously the candidates are going to have different levels of experience. Um, and they can budge a little bit, they can go up, but there's a candidate that has more experience than what they were originally thinking, but this is a really solid candidate. They're willing to budge a little bit, okay? But you don't ever wanna go in there and give them an astronomical number because what's, what's gonna happen is they're just gonna eliminate you completely because they don't want to um, offend you by giving you an offer that's much lower because that's really what they budgeted for. So do your research, really understand some kind of range um, that this role is going to be in. Uh, remember, so it's it's better to discuss your salary range rather than a specific number during the interview and leaving room for negotiation. So you can say, you know, I saw the range that you posted online. I'm definitely in line with that range, that salary range. And even though you might, maybe you have more experience than, than um, what they're asking for, they're going to see that and they're going to acknowledge that. And they're most likely going to give you a little bit more um, if they can in their budget because of your experience. So just, but don't think you can go into it with a little bit of experience and get the top of the range either. So just be very um, uh, clear about the range. And again, don't talk about specific numbers. Don't go in there and say, I want this exact amount of money say, I want to be in this within this range, okay? It's also better to err on the side of caution and quote a slightly higher number as it's easier to negotiate downward than upward. So if you do wanna go a little bit higher, it's gonna be easier to go a little bit higher and they might drop you a little bit and say, what about this number? To Then having to say, okay, I want this. Oh, now I wanna go up a little bit. Okay, so keep that as a general rule of thumb. And this is uh, just kind of some verbiage of what you can actually say is, based on my skills and experience and on the current industry rates, I'm looking for a salary around, do a range, right? This number to this number. Okay, I hope that answers your questions and helps you uh, better understand. I, it's It could be a tricky question because sometimes when you say, 
uh, what, like on my end, if I'm asking a candidate, what kind of salary range are you in? They get nervous and they say, well, what kind of salary range are you looking for? <laughs> so you kind of want to avoid that situation because then it creates some awkwardness. Um, so, but if you've done your research, you're going to understand what the market trends are and what's going to be reasonable in that sense. Okay. Uh, are you applying for other jobs? So a lot of companies will ask you this. Basically, they want to know if you're genuinely interested in the position or if it's just one of your many options. So simply, they just want to know if you're their top choice um, or if you're, they're just another drop in the bucket of interviews that you're doing. So if you're applying for, if you're applying for other jobs, say so, don't say, oh, no, I'm not applying. Be honest and open. Um, but you don't have to necessarily say where you're applying unless you have another offer on the table. But they might want to know where in the hiring process you are with other companies. So you could say, you know, I'm on my third interview with another company. Um, just letting you know, I want to be open and transparent. It's better to be that way than not. And then they think that you're a really great candidate. They want to get you on your team, but you've already been getting pretty much been snatched up by another company. So you don't want to waste their time either. So just be very honest. Um, they, uh, they might want to know, um, sorry, they, you can also mention that you're actually looking for other offers um, if they ask you. So again, be very transparent in your job search if they ask. If they don't ask, you don't have to necessarily say anything, but do be honest if that's the case. And then another question which they might ask you, although it's become more and more uh, <laughs> common these days, is if you have a gap year or some gap time in your resume, okay? Number one, be honest on your resume. Don't try to fill in those gaps because you're nervous about having a gap in your resume. It's it's okay. And honestly, out of the hundreds and hundreds of resumes that I've written, I would say probably 90% of them have a gap. But it's not about the gap, it's about explaining why you have the gap, okay? So make sure you are able to provide some kind of an explanation about why you decided to pursue a gap year, if you did, or if it was unpursued. Um, and focus on what came out of that. So it could be, um, it's always about kind of the positive aspect of it. You know what, I left this job because I wanted to pursue something different. And I did use that time to really go on LinkedIn, do some learning platforms, or take a course on this to kind of up level my, my expertise in this area, but always have some kind of reasoning behind it. And another piece is if you can explain your gaps in your resume before they ask, that's even better. So maybe in the first question where they talk about walk me through your resume or tell me about yourself, you can kind of add that into your story about, you know what, I had a six month, month gap here, I decided to take some time off to do this or to take care of a sick family member. But while I did that, I worked on this on myself or on you know a course or a training or something. So have something positive to, to bring out of it um, when it comes to talking about gaps. And then how to structure your interview. So I'm gonna give you a more specific example of when they say, tell me about yourself or walk me through your interview. So like I said earlier, think like a storyteller. They wanna hear a story about who you are as a person and a candidate. So make sure your story has a great beginning, a great middle, and an end that makes the interviewer like wanna root for you to win the job. Like you wanna grab their attention where they're like, oh, this is such a cool story. Like I really want this person to have this job. Talk about a relevant incident that made you keen on your profession that you're pursuing and follow up by discussing your education. In the story, make sure you're weaving together how your academic training and your passion for the subject or industry combined with your work experience make you a great fit for the job. So I did a little example here to kind of give you a, a, a solid example of what it might sound like. So you could say, I come from a small town where opportunities are limited. Since good schools are a rarity, I started using online learning to stay up to date with the best. That's where I learned to code, and then I went to get up my certification as a computer programmer. After I got my first job as a front-end coder, I continued to invest time in mastering both front-end and back-end languages, tools, and frameworks. So you're kind of giving them that story about where you started, how you got to where you are now, and it's, it's, um, it's a story that they're gonna be interested in, right? They're gonna wanna hear more about it. How to structure the interview. So again, um, these are just some additional tips is always smile and have open body language. And then I put in the TED Talk tip about raising your arms. So don't forget about that. Find a way to break the ice. Find something relatable or something you have in common with them. So especially if it's an in-person interview, it might be easier because you can look around the office and see if they have a picture of their dog. You can say, oh my gosh, I love your, what kind of dog do you have? How long have you had her? Start talking about things that they get them 
uh, to kind of open up to you. It just makes the tension a little bit um, more relaxed. And it also, or if you can find some relatability or some commonality between you and that person, um, whether even if you give them a compliment, you know, something like, oh, I just love, you know, I'm sure guys aren't going to say this, but girls can, <laughs> can say something like, I love your nail color. Or if it's a guy, you can say, oh, I see that you studied at such and such university. Um, I was a, always a huge fan of that school or however, whatever feels comfortable for you. But try to find something to, to compliment them if you can't find a common ground or something relatable. But it just helps kind of break the ice at the beginning of the interview. And you can have a human to human conversation and not feel so stiff about it. Um, repeat the question if you need to hear it one more time. So if they ask you a question, and maybe you're thinking too much and you, you're like, oh, no, I didn't hear anything they said. You can ask them to repeat it or you can repeat it yourself for more clarity and say, OK, you can say, you know, you said you'd like to know what kind of skills I bring to the company. Well, these are the skills that I would be able to bring to this role. So sometimes repeating it yourself can kind of help you give you a few more seconds to think about how you're going to answer that question and make you a little bit more confident. But never be afraid to ask them to to repeat it if you don't understand the question. If you have to speak about something negative or a negative result, always follow up with something positive that you learned from it or a solution you came up to correct it. So I'm just going to throw out something around what I'm used to with sales numbers. So let's say you had a really difficult year in sales. Um, instead of just saying, oh, you know, we were down 15 percent that year, you want to say we were down 15 percent. However, what I learned from that is that this wasn't working. So I made some adjustments and we decided to start doing things this way and always have a solution to anything negative. OK, because what that's also part of your problem solving skills. They want to look for candidates that are forward thinking. So if you ever stop or, I'm sorry, if a candidate stops and just stops at something negative, they're going to say, OK, <laughs> then what'd you do about it? So always have a solution to anything that's kind of negative or that that is not at the result that you wanted. And then at the end of the interview, make sure you ask your interviewer questions because you want to get to know you want to show your interest, but also get to know some more information about the company. So if you have specific questions about things, um, you know, related to an HR, we get this a lot as, you know, benefits or time off or all those things. That's fine. But ask the interviewer, why do you like working for this company? It's probably going to give you some more insight about the culture um, and how things work in that company. Talk about, um, you know, what is the growth outlook for the company? Is the company growing? How are they doing? Because that's also important, too, when you're considering a role. You want to make sure you're getting with a company that's actually having growth. Um, and what are the ideal qualities that you're looking for in a candidate for this role? That's going to help you in terms of understanding specifically if there's something that, that um, they really want to have in this candidate and if you have that or not. And how soon are you looking to fill the position? Some companies take, I'm sorry, we're going a little bit over time, but I have so much information to share with you, so I hope you can stay on. Um, but um, some companies take their time. It could take, you know, process could take several months because they're, they're you know, trying to find the right candidate for that role. And some companies are really desperate to fill a position because they need that person. So it's good to understand the timeline for your sake as well um, and for them to have some transparency. So I'm going to do some quick Q&A, but first I want to give you guys a special gift for joining me tonight. I really appreciate it. And I hope that you found value in some of the things that I said. Um, I am offering you a free 30-minute strategy session. So um, you can just scan the QR code on the screen and book a call with me. Um, we'll just talk about, you know, your next career move, any uh, growth and sorry, growth and implementation of today's training and find out more information about the Luxify program and resume and career coaching options available to you. Um, but also just to kind of help you strategize what your next steps are in your career. And then in addition, I'm going to give you 25% off one of my resume packages or coaching packages, if that's something that interests you. Um, just again, scan the QR code. It'll just book a call with me and we can I can talk more. If you're interested in any of these um, services, I can kind of talk through the details and tell you what, what I have to offer. But um, a lot of it is the things that I went over, ATS friendly resume, um, ATS friendly cover letter, SEO optimized LinkedIn profile. And then in terms of coaching, I do career coaching interview preparation sessions and leadership coaching as well. So, or if you just want to hop on a call and just get to know me and ask some questions, I'm good with that too. So let's go into some Q&A. Um, if you have any questions from the presentation or want to know anything, please just um, pop it in the chat and I'm happy to answer um, any questions that you guys have.
Reverse recruiting services. Can you explain that? Because I don't know if I've heard of reverse recruiting services. Anybody have any other questions? Give you guys a couple more minutes to think. No questions. Okay, can you at least let me know or give me a thumbs up if you at least learn something from this presentation or found some value in what I talked about. Awesome. Thank you. <laughs> okay. It's when you reverse the roles and you work for the candidate, helping them land the job as opposed to working for the company. Oh yeah. So I actually, um, I'm not, well, I do some recruiting consulting wise, um, but I do with some of my coaching clients, I do help them try to get interviews, land jobs, um, and uh, and work specifically for the candidates, not the companies. So, and actually that's actually the majority of what I do is I work for the candidates versus for companies. Awesome, thanks Alejandra, you're welcome. Any other questions? I will stop. Sharing my screen as well, so you don't have to stare at that anymore. Awesome. Okay. Well, no other questions. Thank you guys so much for hanging in there with me. Um, I really am. I'm, I'm, I love helping. Others. Oh, question. Okay. I submitted a Word doc resume to an internal recruiter at a company. I was interested in not hear back, but should I submit the same resume to the company internal database? Um, yeah, you can absolutely you can absolutely um, resubmit it. I would again, like I said earlier, look at the job description and make sure that it's aligned. Also, as a side note with resumes, I would always submit the PDF version, never the Word doc version. You want the uneditable version. Um, in addition to that, one of the things that I do with resumes is I do a clickable link on your link to your LinkedIn profile on your resume, and so that only works on the PDF version. It just makes it easier for them. Um, but definitely always send the PDF. And yes, I would definitely go ahead and resubmit it, but just review it and make sure it's aligned with the job description. AI tools that could help out a job seeker in the job search. You know what? I don't know of any specifically. However, I would probably guarantee there are some out there. I mean, I feel like AI is popping up in every field I can imagine. Um, but I, yeah, I don't even know. I know LinkedIn has some AI features. I'm not sure if they have it in terms of job search, but definitely something to research. And I will research on my on my own as well. It's, that's an interesting question. Oh, the recruiter asked for the word doc. That's very interesting. Okay, well, I stand corrected. I, I've never had anybody specifically want a word doc, but um, maybe it's just the formatting with their system. But yeah, that's fine. Should there be any differences in applying for a remote job versus an on-site job? Um, I would just say in terms of remote, you're working more independently most of the time. So um, showcasing that you can be effective working independently, but also you do enjoy the teamwork and the collaboration with other members of your department. Um, I would put, you know, works, you could add something about works well independently or in a team environment, so they understand that you're able to do that. But otherwise, I really don't think there's anything that's um, uh, specifically differentiated other than that. All right, and I think that's all the questions. Anything else? And again, hop on my calendar. I'm happy to do you know a, that strategy session that I'm offering all of you. And um, just let me know when you sign up that you met me on this um, this training call, uh, and I can give you some more pointers or tips specific to your situation. Um, and kind of give you some strategies and, and guidelines that can help you out in that sense. All right, guys, I won't keep you any longer. I hope you all have an amazing night and an amazing weekend. And um, connect with me on, actually, I forgot to give you my contact information. So let me quickly share this one more time. Um, I will give you my email. That's, again, the QR code for my calendar. But that's uh, my website, my email. 
um, retailtrainer.pro, it goes straight to my Calendly link. Um, connect with me on LinkedIn. I'm on LinkedIn a lot. I do a lot, I, I'm, I'm very active on LinkedIn. So connect with me on LinkedIn as well. All right, awesome. Thank you all so much. I so appreciate it. Have a wonderful weekend. Thank you, Kristen. Thank you.